So I don't think that John really needs to be introduced. Though. Uh, he's really well known for his, uh, he's a white professor uh, of moral philosophy at University of Oxford since 2000. He is well known for his work in economics, in philosophy, and also in climate change. Uh, John taught economics from 1972 to 1992, and philosophy from 1992 till now. I think one of his sorry. I think one of his important contribution has been to insist on the fact that economical uh, questions are clearly related to philosophical uh, ones, and I think this is a big thing that uh, I think this is a really special contribution that we cannot see among a lot of philosophers. Another important contribution is the book, which is the subject of our symposium today. So, uh, rationality through reasoning. So, thank you, John, for act having accepted to come to Montreal to talk about it. Well, thank you for the int introduction, Jose. Um, of course I accepted promptly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who wouldn't? This is a, this is a, this is a great honor. I, I, I really do appreciate it um, that you invited me and that the others of you um, have come along. Um, I'm, I'm really very touched that you should uh, want me to. Um, and uh, I have to thank Jose not just for organizing um, this event, but for making a major contribution to the book itself. Uh, she was in Oxford for a year, and during the year we talked very often um, about topics in the book, and Jose went through it very carefully um, and made very useful contributions, which have made a, a, a big difference to uh, what's in the book. She was one of the people who've made um, a significant uh, contribution to my writing. I'm really grateful to her uh, for that. And to the other people who've uh, come here to talk about it um, with me uh, today, um, uh, Andrew, first of all, who was uh, a, a officially a student of mine at the time when I began writing the book, unbelievable numbers of years ago. Um, and we talked about the, the, the subjects often. I, I suspect that the, quite a lot of the ideas in the book may well have come from Andrew, but I, you know, I didn't notice who they actually came from originally. So there's a major, major contribution from uh, him too, from uh, Nadim, who's particularly helpful um, to me uh, over the question of the normativity of uh, uh, rationality, especially. Um, he, he's made a big difference. And Paul, who I met first only a few years ago, but we had really a discussion which was absolutely illuminating uh, to me, um, made me do a lot of free writing um, in, the, in the recent uh, uh, years, in the, in the last few years of writing the book, um, I, I learned a fantastic amount from him. Um, so those four are um, really the people who I would count as the, the ones who've had the most influence on the book, uh, except possibly with, um, I should also add, um, Kieran Setia, who I think wanted to be here but, but couldn't. He too made a, a big difference. Um, and I have to mention uh, Derek Parfit as well, whose influence is rather different. Um, a lot of the book is sort of, um, is a hidden response. It doesn't it display itself as a response to Parfit, but I spent many hours arguing with him about one thing and another. And I suspect that his, his uh, influence on the structure of the book is much bigger than I uh, recognize uh, even myself. So, so um, two of the important people are absent, but the other four are here, and I I'm, I'm really appreciate uh, that. This book um, originated as a response to uh, what moral philosophers sometimes call the problem of, of motivation. Um, we recognize that a belief can 
motivate uh, uh, an action. Um, and I understand that in a particular form. I uh, recognize that a normative belief, a belief about what we ought to do, can sometimes bring us to intend to do something. And an intention is a sort of motivation. And there's a tradition in moral philosophy to see that there's some sort of a problem with this, uh, a tradition that takes its origin from Hume, who said, reason alone cannot motivate any action of the will. And that's often been taken recently to mean that a belief alone cannot motivate uh, the will. So people see it as a problem. How can a belief bring you uh, to act or to motivate you to act? Now, the first problem about that is to see why that's supposed to be a problem. Um, I mean, of course, people uh, often intend to do what they do, uh, intend to do something because they believe they ought to do it. And um, we could just say, well, we, we have a natural disposition to do that, or it may be even not a natural one, but a taught disposition. But at any rate, we're disposed to intend to do what we believe we ought to do. And what could be problematic about that? There's nothing in psychological theory or anywhere else that says you couldn't have a causal disposition, which brings you to intend to do something that you believe uh, you ought to do. So it's, it's hard to see why that should even have appeared uh, as a problem. But I think the problem is that a mere causal connection between believing something and intending uh, to act um, is not good enough from the point of view of the moral philosophers. They want this disposition to work in the right way. They wouldn't count it as a, mot as a motivating, uh, they wouldn't count it as your belief as motivating you if the way that it caused you to act was not one that met certain conditions. And um, uh, specifically, they may think, well, it's got to be seen as some sort of reasoning or something like that. Um, so they want the disposition to work in the right way. And the problem of motivation, I guess, is to see what is, think, what is this right way and, and, and how does that work uh, exactly. And at any rate, that's what this book intend, uh, sets out to do. This book sets out to explain how that disposition to intend to do what you believe you ought to do can actually happen, work, through a process of reasoning. So there is a, a process of reasoning that takes you from the normative belief to uh, the intention. That's what the book set out to do. And um, it set out to do something rather more ambitious, which was to say how this reasoning, something about the reasoning process. So this reasoning process actually is an act of yours. It's something that you do rather than something that merely happens to you. And if that conclusion can really be brought off, I think that's it's a very satisfactory sort of conclusion because it explains how we can motivate ourselves to do to act in the way that we believe uh, we ought to. It gives us a, a, an opportunity for self-motivation. It doesn't just mean that we have to sit back and wait to find ourselves uh, being motivated. So that's the aim uh, of the book. It arose as a response to the idea of the problem of motivation. Now, early on in this story about um, uh, the motivation problem, rationality got um, uh, involved. Um, not, I think, uh, originally with Hume, but with uh, Hume's followers, um, Humeans, they often think that um, not only is it so that you have a disposition to intend to do what you believe you ought to do, but furthermore, you're not rational if you don't. Um, it's, it's a requirement of rationality, they say, that you intend to do what you believe you ought to do. That's, that's a pretty traditional view. Um, failing to intend to do what you believe you ought to do is something called acrasia, or at any rate, it's a version of what's called uh, a crasher. An acratic person is somebody who doesn't intend to do what she believes uh, she ought to do. And um, it's a very traditional idea that a is irrational. Um, and 
this book, a lot of this book, is about the rationality or the um, irrationality of akrasia. Um, as the opposite of uh, akrasia, I invented the word enkrasia, um, which is not a Greek word. The, the Greek word is enkratia, but I deliberately chose a non-Greek word um, as the opposite of uh, akrasia because enkratia, as I understand it, involves um, doing what you believe you ought to do in a case where that actually involves a bit of effort, where you're tempted to do the other thing. Whereas enkrasia doesn't necessarily involve any, any sort of an, an effort. It's simply intending to do what you believe you ought to do. Um, I think that that's irrational. Uh, failing to do that is uh, irrational. Um, it's very traditional to think that it's irrational, although we can certainly uh, argue about it. And so that's how the idea of rationality is involved in this motivation question from um, the beginning. But it's important to realize that merely recognizing that it's irrational doesn't solve the motivation problem. Um, it may tell you that if somebody who doesn't, it, it, it does tell you that somebody who doesn't intend to do what she believes she ought to do is irrational. But it doesn't explain how people get to intend to do what they believe they ought to do, how they get to be rational in this particular uh, uh, instance. So um, we've got a lot of work to do, even once we recognize that rationality is involved. That really hasn't got us very far. But it did lead me to take rationality as a sort of guide to this book, what should be in the book. And the book is, to a large extent, about uh, rationality. I take it that reasoning the activity that brings us to, to be encratic, or can bring us to be encratic, um, is l an example of reasoning in general, has a feature that reasoning in general has, which is that it helps us to improve our rationality. I think that reasoning is, a, is an activity that we sometimes indulge in, in order to make ourselves more rational than we would otherwise uh, um, be. I think of it as, as a self-help activity. Sometimes we're rather automatically uh, rational, um, but sometimes that the automatic, our automatic um, subpersonal psychological processes don't ensure that we're rational in particular respects, and reasoning is a means by which we can bring ourselves to be rational uh, in, in those particular uh, cases. So, um, in the course of trying to argue that reasoning is a means by which we motivate ourselves, I found myself exploring the relationship between reasoning, the activity, and rationality. And to do that, I had to start by investigating this um, thing called uh, rationality. And there was a preliminary to that too. So thinking about rationality was a preliminary to thinking about reasoning. And as a preliminary to thinking about rationality, I found I had to do something about normativity. Because in the literature of philosophy, um, rationality and normativity are very deeply entangled. They're very much entangled uh, together. The philo philosophy of rationality is very often pretty much the same thing as the philosophy of reasons, which are a feature of uh, normativity. Since reasons became very, very <coughs> popular in moral philosophy um, around about 1970 uh, or so, there's been lots and lots of, reason, of literature on reasons, and that's very much also treated as literature on rationality. Indeed, a lot of people just take it for granted that rationality is nothing other than responding correctly uh, to reasons, or in some cases not to reasons, actual reasons, but to beliefs about reasons or reason um, uh, beliefs. That's to say, beliefs about fact, of, uh, beliefs about facts, um, beliefs whose contents are propositions, where those propositions, if true, would constitute uh, reasons. That's a very common view. In fact, near enough universal, I would say, that rationality consists in responding correctly to reason. So that explains this entanglement between rationality and normativity. Um, 
and I certainly think there's something right about that, because the part of uh, rationality that I mentioned already and started me off, um, Enkrasia, intending to do what you believe you ought to do, well, that is responding correctly to beliefs uh, uh, about reasons. Um, Believing that you ought to do something is, to put it another way, believing that you've got conclusive reasons to do it or something along those lines. And um, if you're rational, that's to say you're encratic, then you will intend to do that. So then you will be responding correctly to your belief about conclusive uh, reasons. So encrasia is indeed something to do like responding correctly to beliefs uh, uh, about reasons. But it isn't by any means the whole of rationality. That's the, 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 the point that I want to make about this. Although there is this bit of rationality that's to do with responding correctly to reasons and is therefore related to normativity, the rest of rationality um, uh, is, is not. And that's one of the things that's argued uh, in the book. Anyhow, it meant that in order to, as a preliminary to talking about rationality, I had to think about normativity in general. And the book starts off with a few chapters about normativity, uh, about ought, um, which I take to be what I call this, the central uh, uh, normative property. And um, also about reasons, which are, as I said, the fashionable ones, the ones that people spend a lot of time on. Uh, now, one of the things that's stressed in the book talking about normativity is that um, we have to recognize that some of our, um, uh, some ought propositions, propositions about ought, are, as I say, personal. They, uh, um, if, if I say uh, that uh, I ought not to talk too long, um, that ought is something that belongs to me. I have, as you might put it, the responsibility for uh, satisfying that ought. I call it a, a, an owned ought. Um, of, often in the literature it's called a personal ought. And um, we have to recognize that um, uh, encrasia is about personal oughts. Um, uh, if when, you, um, when rationality requires you to intend to do what you believe you ought to do, that, that ought, that um, it has to be one that you are responsible for, that belongs to you. And that's something that's uh, stressed um, in the book. Um, the book does aim to counter the recent obsession with reasons um, in favor of more interest in deontic notions such as ought and permission. That's another thing that happens at that point in the book. Um, then the book goes on to uh, a rationality. Um, it denies actually that rationality consists in responding correctly to reasons or to uh, reason beliefs. Um, instead, it says that rationality is to be understood as a collection of requirements so it starts off talking about rationality by analyzing the notion of a requirement. And I have a special account of what requirements are, which gives uh, um, uh, conclusions about the logic uh, of requirements. And then the book just goes on, in effect, to list some requirements of um, uh, rationality. Um, now, listing is not entirely satisfactory. Because it would be nice to say what unifies these various requirements that have a place in the list of requirements of rationality, what makes them all requirements of one thing, which is rationality. But I'm sorry to say I haven't actually been able to say exactly what unifies them. I know some things that unify them. I think rationality is about proper order in the mind. Rationality is a... Is a property of the mind, and furthermore, it supervenes on other properties of the mind. Rationality supervenes uh, on, on the mind. Um, for example, the requirement of rationality is not to have contradictory beliefs. You're required not to have contradictory beliefs. You're required to intend what you believe is a means to an end that you intend. And these are relations between attitudes. 
beliefs, uh, uh, intentions, and so on. They're, they're all in the mind. So rationality is about good order in the mind, but that isn't enough to set a clear boundary to what rationality um, is. Listing requirements is not adequate, and there are real questions about the boundaries of rationality that I can't say um, that I've uh, really given any sort of conclusive answer to. For example, what about forgetting? Sometimes um, if you have an intention and you don't carry it out because you just forget it. Now, in some circumstances that seems intuitively to be irrational because rational people carry out their intentions. They don't just have an intention and all of a sudden not have an inten that, that intention. Something goes wrong there. But on the other hand, it's obviously some sort of a version of forgetting. And there are clearly cases where it's, a, where it's not irrational to forget. In a long life, you forget a lot of things. And that isn't, we would normally think, always a failure of rationality. So the boundary between Forgetting that's irrational and forgetting that isn't is not a very clear one, and I haven't got good criteria, I'm sorry to say, um, for uh, identifying where that boundary um, is. Um, one of the requirements of rationality, though, is this one in Krasia that I've mentioned. I do think that's required by uh, rationality. But you'll find, if you look at the book, that more space is given in it to um, the instrumental requirement to intend to do what you believe is a means implied by an end that, that you intend. And that's because that actually is, is an easier requirement to get a grip on. It's less controversial. Many people do think that um, that, 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 well, nearly everybody thinks that's a requirement of rationality. And many people are willing to grant that there is some process of reasoning that can bring you to satisfy that. So it makes a good entry point into thinking about practical rationality, which is rationality to do with intentions, rather than encrasia, which is more difficult and uh, controversial. So I, a lot of my examples of reasoning, practical reasoning, are examples of um, instrumental reasoning, reasoning that brings you to satisfy the instrumental requirement. Um, as well as requirements of rationality in the book, I mentioned basing permissions of rationality. And those are important because, um, well, you'll see why in a moment they're important. I won't say that now. Um, the last thing that happens in the set of chapters on rationality is a chapter that investigates whether rationality is normative. Now, I should emphasize um, what I mean by normative because there are, I think, two um, distinct meanings that are current in philosophy. Um, in many parts of philosophy, people, when they, when they say that something is normative, mean that it's governed by a rule that's a standard of correctness uh, in um, what you do. Um, so any, any system of rules, like, for example, rationality, which can be seen as a system of rules, is going to be automatically normative in that sense, just because it sets up a standard of correctness. But we in moral philosophy use um, normative in a rather stronger sense. We have to recognize that sometimes there are standards of correctness that you've got no reason to conform to. You know, there are all sorts of rules that you've got no reason to obey. Nevertheless, they do constitute a standard of correctness. Um, and so normative in the stronger sense um, uh, I'm not sure it has to be strictly stronger, but at any rate, in another sense. Um, what we in moral philosophy generally mean by normative is having to do with ought or having to do with reasons. So the question about the normativity of rationality is, have you any reason to satisfy the requirements of uh, rationality? And the answer in the book is inconclusive um, about that. Uh, I don't um, uh, argue that you do. Although on the whole, I think probably we do, but there's not no. I haven't been able to demonstrate that, um, and it's therefore rather fortunate that my account of reasoning that follows does not depend on the normativity of uh, rationality, um, or even on the normativity of uh, following rules. And I consider that one of its strengths. Actually, I don't think that reasoning should be. Um, uh, tightly associated with normativity. Um, 
there's a tendency these days to see normativity everywhere. And this is normativity in the strong sense, uh, I mean. Um, but I think we over-normativize over things. And particularly, the theory of reasoning has been over over uh, normativized. And the very first thing that I do when I then turn to reasoning in the book is reject what I call the higher order model of reasoning, which is the, the model of reasoning that in some way or other, that, that says in some way or other that in the course of reasoning, you need to have a belief with a normative content, which is that you ought to have the attitude that the reasoning is leading towards or something along those lines. So that if you reason your way towards, shall we say, to believing the proposition P, somewhere involved in that reasoning, there has to be the belief that you ought to believe P or that you've got strong reason to believe P or the conclusive reason to believe P or something like that. You have to have a belief with a normative content, which is about the attitude that concludes the reasoning in this case, the belief that P. It's a higher order uh, attitude because it's an attitude about the attitudes. It's a higher order normative attitude because it attaches a reason or ought or something to um, this attitude that concludes the reasoning. And I oppose that. I don't think that we need normative beliefs involved uh, actually in, in any way um, in, in reasoning. Um, I'm interested particularly in what I call active reasoning. I said this at the beginning. It's reasoning that you do rather than, there may be passive reasoning, reasoning that just happens in you. I don't deny it, but I'm not, not interested in it. I'm only interested in active uh, reasoning. And I give an account of what active reasoning is. And the first part of it is that it's conscious. So active reasoning, I take it, is uh, reasoning with conscious attitudes at, at any rate. And my model of reasoning is not one that involves higher order uh, attitudes. It's a first order uh, model, and this is a sort of formula for it. Um, uh, it is that in reasoning, you operate consciously on the contents of some of your attitudes, following a rule, and you arrive at a new attitude uh, as, as a result. That's a brief statement of what I think reasoning um, uh, is. Um, notice that it allows reasoning not to be correct. Of course, I think we have to recognize that sometimes you do reasoning, even though your reasoning is incorrect. It doesn't stop it being reasoning. And when it's incorrect, that's because the rule that you follow, which is part of, the, um, of its being reasoning, is an incorrect uh, rule. What makes a rule correct? Well, it's given by a basing permission of rationality. That's why I introduced um, basing permissions. Um, a basing permission says that it's permissible to have some particular attitude on the basis of uh, other attitudes. And a correct rule of reasoning is a rule that corresponds to a, a genuine um, uh, basing permission. So that means that rationality is made correct, validate, I mean, sorry, reasoning is made correct or validated, you might say, by permissions of rationality not by requirements of rationality. Now, there's a difficulty in that, which I'm sorry to say that the book has not properly resolved, I don't think. There are several gaps in this book, and this is, this is one of them. Remember I said at the beginning that I took it that, the, that rationality is a self-help mechanism, reasoning is a self-help mechanism by which we can come to satisfy requirements, to make ourselves more rational. And becoming more rational involves satisfying requirements of rationality that you previously didn't satisfy. So the, 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 what the point of reasoning, what it's for, as you might say, mm -hmm. is to bring you to satisfy requirements. And yet, what makes reasoning correct is not requirements, it's permissions. And the permissions of rationality do not correspond exactly to uh, the requirements um, of rationality. I'll give you a simple example of that. Um, you are permitted by rationality to believe P on the basis of believing, sorry, believe Q on the basis of believing P and believing if P then Q. Um, that seems pretty clearly permitted by rationality. It's permitted by rationality to have a belief that could be derived by modus ponens from other things that you believe. But you're not required 
always to believe P if you believe to believe Q if you believe P and you believe if P then Q not for example if you have not the least interest in Q and it, if it doesn't matter at all to you whether Q there's nothing that says you're not rational if you don't believe Q even if you believe P and you believe if P uh, then Q you can't be expected as Harmon puts it to clatter up your mind with all sorts of perf perfectly pointless beliefs. So there's no requirement to believe Q when you believe P and you believe if P then Q, but there is a permission to believe Q when you believe P and you believe if P then Q. And that's an example of how permissions and requirements come apart. So there is a gap to be filled. If it's permissions that tell you when reasoning is correct, then it needs to be explained how does this correct reasoning serve its purpose of bringing you to satisfy requirements of rationality. And I've made some attempt to close that gap, but it's not a, not a, 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 it's not complete. I need a proper theory of the relation between requirements of rationality and basing permissions of rationality. And to be honest, I haven't got that theory. So that's um, a chunk of the book about uh, reasoning and it brings me right at the end back to um, this motivation question. Um, uh, the book argues that there is what I call encratic reasoning, which is uh, reasoning that can bring you to satisfy the requirement uh, encrasia. Um, it's made correct by what I call the encratic permission. Um, the encratic permission says it's permissible to intend um, to P when you believe, intend to F when you believe you ought um, uh, to F. And you can reason according to that basing, sorry, it's correct to base an intention to F on your belief that you ought to F. And uh, it's correct to reason according to that um, permission. And if you do reason according to that permission, this will often bring you to satisfy uh, encrasia. It may go beyond encrasia itself because the permission is actually rather wider than the than encrasia. Um, let me say, um, you'll find if you look at this list of requirements that I mentioned, that the requirements are nearly all really rather complicated. They've all got com complicating clauses in them. And encrasia has some complicating clauses in, which I've spared you from mentioning uh, at the moment. So the so encrasia is not half as simple as I've described it. It's not the requirement to intend to do what you believe you ought to do. It obviously can't be exactly the requirement to intend to do uh, what you believe you ought to do because um, you might think that you will do this thing anyway whether or not you intend to. So there's actually no need uh, uh, for you to intend it. I mean suppose you think um, that you uh, ought to go to Venice um, but you believe that you are in the hands of a gang of kidnappers that are already making it so that you go to Venice, then you don't need to intend uh, to go to Venice. Um, so uh, there are complexities in um, encrasia, and the encratic permission doesn't have so many of those complexities. It's a broader uh, uh, notion. But anyhow, I do believe that encratic reasoning following the encratic permission can often bring you to satisfy encrasia. Um, by the end of the book, I've hoped and I've given enough of an account of what reasoning is to be able to say, look, this process does satisfy all the conditions that I've set up as uh, um, sufficient for a process to be reasoning. So it really is a process of, of reasoning. And it's meant, therefore, to solve the motivation problem in the way that I said is really satisfactory. It's explaining how it, can, how it is that we can motivate ourselves through a process of reasoning to intend to do what we believe we ought to do. That's the end of the book.